Good evening. I am LaShonda Wallace, and I welcome you to our webinar, webinar, So You Know About HIV Medication Weight Gain, with Drs. Janelle Montgomery and Amanda, better known as Mandy Boykin. Today's event um, will be um, an overview of Seeds of Healing. We will give you some information about Soton, the Soton platform, and then we will begin our discussion. This is a Soton production, which is an affiliate of Seeds of Healing. Seeds of Healing is an HIV awareness and advocacy organization whose mission is to deconstruct myths that perpetuate HIV stigma and to generate support for all people living with or affected by HIV. Our intimate work strive to eliminate disparities in HIV outcomes for Black women. We are recording this webinar and we'll share this webinar from our YouTube channel soon after. Attendees participation is anonymous. So in other words, if you are not, if you are not a panelist, your participation is anonymous. We cannot see your video nor your name. We welcome you to stay, but if you have a conflict with the recording, please excuse yourself. We ask that you leave comments and questions in the Q&A box and we will address them towards the end of the discussion if there is something that was not covered in our discussion. So let me introduce you to our panelists. We have Dr. Janelle Montgomery. Dr. Montgomery is a clinical pharmacist practitioner with Duke Neurology Clinic and an adjunct faculty for UNC Eshelman School of Pharmacy. She received her doctor of pharmacy degree from UNC Eshelman School of Pharmacy. She has clinical practice experience in rheumatology and has transitioned her focus to neurological disorder management. Part of her professional training, training focused on HIV management, and she has ongoing experience with specialty pharmacy and immunosuppressant management. Dr. Mandy McCoy is a clinical pharmacist with UNC Health. She serves as the lead clinical pharmacist for the Carolina Assessment of Medications Program, better known as the CAMP Clinic, as well as a clinical pharmacist practitioner at Carolina Advanced Health. Dr. Boykin has clinical experience in chronic disease state management, polypharmacy, and medication access. Her professional training included HIV management. Her approach to care is to develop relationships with patients and their healthcare providers to provide patient-centered care and optimize medication regimens by ensuring safety, efficacy, and affordability. Benita Spratley has lived with a diagnosis of HIV for over 30 years and has been an advocate working in the field of HIV for 20 years or more. She thrives while helping the fight against stigma. Benita believes in living a healthy life through self-care, medication, adherence, and maintaining engagement with health providers. Benita is passionate about connecting those persons who are isolated while living in silence with others who share the commonality for a sense of belonging. She is one of two of our Soul Time moderators. So without further delay, we're going to share with you Soul Time. Hey ladies, welcome to Soul Time. My name is Benita Spradley, one of the moderators and content contributors here. And we're excited to have you aboard. Hello, Queens, and welcome to So Time. I'm Tamisha Isaac, also one of your moderators and content contributors. I'm honored to have you join us. So Time is a platform for Black women to connect across the U.S. to provide tools for self-care and encourage consistent adherence. So Time is a platform for us, created by us, to collaborate and center issues that affects Black women, the struggle causes by a diagnosis or chronic illness. We have roots with specific topics to cater to the mission of So Time, but uplift, empower, and strengthen you as we power through on this journey. Surrounding yourself with women that look like you in a safe space, where you are free to be yourself while learning from each other and sharing resources that can enhance your way of life on the course of this journey. We are here for each one of you. We welcome you and we look forward to networking, supporting one another and learning new things as we come together on this Soul Time website. Welcome. welcome.
Um, noon, everyone. Thank you, LaShonda. Um, so, so time, um, of course, is a platform that allows us to network. Um, I've been the moderator and contributor for some time now. Um, and we share quite a bit of information um, one to another, keeping each other abreast, um, supporting one another, and just uh, staying encouraged, um, reaching out, talking about uh, topics such as this, and hoping to, in the future, have uh, other webinars that will indeed um, give us information and feedback as we continue on this fight and this journey, living with HIV. Thank you, Benita. And now we will turn the discussion over to Dr. Montgomery and Dr. McCoy. Hey, thanks, LaShonda. Um, so we wanna thank everyone for having us. Um, we think this is a really important topic and we were able to um, just gather some information that we hope will be helpful for you. Um, so I'm going to start off and I'm gonna share my screen, um, but I'm going to talk about just the progression of how we think about um, weight gain. And we'll talk about this thing called lipodystrophy um, with these medications and between like each type of medication, what that might look like. Um, we'll also talk about different risk factors um, and what the consequences are of um, weight gain. And then Mandy will talk to you about long-term consequences and then um, as well as switch, uh, whether that might be an option or if it's a good um, option for patients. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen here. All right. Okay, so this first slide um, might look familiar to many people on the um, on the call here. Um, so I just wanted to start with just a background about what different types of medication groups there are, because that's how we tend to talk about clinical trials and information we find is not just individual medications, but also what class they're in. Um, so I thought this slide might be helpful just as a baseline to see like what um, class of medication it is. So for example, if you look at that first um, rectangle, we have our non-nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors. And as you can see in like many of the mechanisms of these medications, the goal is to prevent the um, HIV uh, virus from replicating itself. So um, it's not as important to know how each medication works. But I just wanted to make sure you knew which medication fell into which type of, which group of medication. So you can see on that far, um, um, right-hand column, which um, medications would be under the, each class of medication. Um, let's see, okay. And so let's go to the next slide here. So this is another group of medications. So ones you might see um, that are, you might be familiar with. So in that first slide you saw, the, hold on, let's see, slide's frozen here. Oh. Here we go. Um, that first slide, you might be more familiar with that first row there, the NNRTIs, and also the second row, which is the NRTIs. Um, we also commonly see protease inhibitors as well. And then you, another top, another class that we'll talk about today are the integrase inhibitors. So that second row there, you see fairly commonly and they have a lot of information about as well. And we have newer medications as well, the attachment inhibitors, um, which you might see a little bit less often, but that's also um, used in practice. So this is an important slide here. And the importance of this slide is just looking at the where we started and where we are now. Um, so a lot of medications that were we first began with, like the Zidovudine that we um, that came out in 1987, we don't use really as much because it had more side effects. Um, you might have to take more um, tablets during the day. So um, we've gotten better with the side effects that you see with medications. Um, and so you'll kind of see this um, progression of how many times you have to take a medication per day, which less is more. Um, and then also the history of the medications and the types of side effects they have. So in terms of weight gain, um, you did see that more often with older medications. So like the Zidovudine I mentioned, the Stabudine, um, the Danacine, and then also um, with protease inhibitors such as Indinavir, which was approved in 1996. But as we move forward, 
you can see there's a lot of medication options. There's combinations of medications, which is how we uh, medicate or how HIV is typically treated. Um, so you kind of see this progression of different uh, medication options and then how they're combined together. So what is lipodystrophy? So you might see this word um, come up. Um, so I just wanna make sure everybody is aware of what it is. Um, so it's an abnormal change in fat just distribution around the body. So this can mean either you have more fat or you lose fat. Um, but what you see with um, antiretroviral therapy for HIV management is that it's typically you have um, a change in where fat is and then also you have that weight gain. Um, the areas that you see um, this concentrated in is the waist and abdomen, um, breast, neck, neck, um, back, and your organs. So this picture that you see in the bottom right-hand corner is just when we talk about where fat can accumulate and where you see it with HIV medications, you have visceral fat, which is more around your organs, and it can kind of cause your stomach to kind of push out. And then you also have subcutaneous fat, which is kind of right under your skin. Um, so you can see both types with HIV medications, and you can also see it with general like obesity and weight gain. You can see that increase, particularly of subcutaneous fat. Um, so you can kind of see them both in similar areas. So why are we concerned about weight gain? Um, so Mandy will talk more about this, but we really want people to stay as healthy for as long as possible, whether it's um, someone who's taking an HIV medication or just someone in general who just wants to have good health. We wanna make sure that we're avoiding having high cholesterol, the risk of having heart disease, um, having additional weight can cause diabetes and insulin resistance and stroke, and also just less things that we're less able to kind of quantify. So we want you to be able to be mobile. We want people to have a good quality of life. And it also can affect mental health as well. So if we address these issues and hopefully we can improve all of these things and have um, good, good outcomes long-term. So what are risk factors for weight gain? So they have looked very closely at this. And there's actually been some really good information um, that's come out in the past few years. Um, so we'll talk more about certain antiretroviral medications that can increase your risk for weight gain. They've also found that the female sex can have an increase in weight gain compared to males. So age also increases your risk, so around greater than 35 to 40 years of age. They also talk about race and they've looked at which race um, and also broken down by um, gender as to what the impact of, of weight gain is. So if you look on the right at this um, graph, what you can see at the top, hold on, yeah. move this, my screen over, there we go. Um, what you can see at the top is that um, they found that black patients um, had a greater weight change compared to non-black patients. And that's kind of the darker line at the top are the black patients. And at the bottom, you can see that black females in particular had a much higher weight gain compared to, or weight change um, and gain compared to black males are, is the next one, but the next one down is non-black females. And then the least amount of weight gain was non-black males. So it's really important to know like what your risk factors are and how you might fit into this, just so we can go ahead and address that. Um, another thing just I like to put as a disclaimer is that black patients are also underrepresented in clinical trials. So just keep in mind kind of how many people might be representing you in these trials. Um, another risk factor is, let's see, let's back over, length of time on antiretroviral therapy. Um, someone who has a higher initial body fat level or has high triglyceride levels. And then also people who have more advanced disease. So if you have a lower CD4 count, a higher viral load, they found that there's an increased um, change in weight. And the, one thing that's really interesting about this topic is how just the epidemic of obesity contributes to um, the increase in weight gain that you see with antiretroviral medications. So you can see it, it's probably a little flatter than it's supposed to be, but you can see the increase in obesity um, in the US over time. And, and also severe obesity as well. So this is trending up as well. So the question becomes is what's contributing to the weight gain? Is it the medications themselves or is it just a general increase in obesity over time? And then this is, uh, I think, an important slide, just looking at obesity among non-Hispanic Black adults um, between 2017 and 2019. And in here, you can also, just another demonstration of the, um, you can see that the kind of the darker orange rust color is greater than 35% of patients or people in the, in the states um, who are Black who have um, obesity. So this is you know, quite a bit of the United States. Uh, so just keeping in mind, again, where we kind of fit into this and how obesity is impacting uh, Black patients or Black people, excuse me. 
So this slide, I think it's also just kind of reiterating and it's a good demonstration of um, what we've seen with the older retroviral treatments compared to the more modern antiretroviral treatments. So at the top, you can see if you have untreated HIV infection, you can have weight loss. And then you can also still with these older treatments see that change in fat distribution. Um, and there's a thought that one of the reasons that um, people gain weight is a return to health. So because you're on medication, you're feeling better, you start to gain weight because you're feeling good or feeling better than you know, having untreated, um, uh, untreated virus. So again, at the top, you see the older regimens, you have that lipodystrophy where you have that um, obesity and potentially some, you could have some weight loss from the side effects of the medication, um, but overall you see kind of this increase in weight gain. And then at the bottom, you see these more modern treatments where they think that it's a more modest weight gain, but is it also contributing that we have general obesity um, that's kind of increasing. So the question becomes what's impacting um, obesity and that and increase in that over time. So one thing to note, which kind of reiterates what I was just saying, that um, they've looked at what are patients' weights kind of at when they start antiretroviral treatment? So they found that at baseline, before you even start medication, um, there's been a shift from 20, a BMI of 23.8 to 25, um, and that's about a 10 pound um, difference. And then, which was what I was um, discussing about the general trend in obesity. They found that for people who start treatment, about 80% of that weight gain occurs in the first year of treatment. They found for women in particular, it's more gradual, but overall that you see most of the weight gain in um, the first year. And then an average of weight, the average weight gain over 96 weeks after starting treatment was about 4.4 pounds. And they also found that about 17% of people in these trials who started antiretroviral treatment over those 96 weeks had more than 10% weight gain. And over here, um, so the, the graph on the right is just showing that eventually the, the weight gain should start to kind of level out or plateau. Um, so you shouldn't see like kind of increasing forever, but you, should, you would see like kind of a initial increase and then kind of a flattening over time. So why do people gain weight? So they haven't quite figured that out yet. So they're trying to pinpoint what is it that's causing people to gain weight on these medications? Is it something about the medication itself? Um, or is it that we talked about that return to health phenomenon where um, previously if you have uncontrolled infection, you can have this um, fat loss and this, um, and, or depletion of the fat, fat stores and cause weight loss. But when you start treatment, potentially you start feeling better and you start gaining weight. You also, there's also a thought that these medications might affect the storage capacity of fat cells. Um, so there might be a greater storage capacity. Um, you might have some differences in how people metabolize, metabolize drugs. So maybe there's more drug in your system that might cause these side effects. And there also might be medications that affect hormones that affect appetite. And then these medications are often better tolerated than newer medications. Um, so you might have an improved side effect profile. So you're not having as much like stomach issues or nausea, um, which might encourage you to um, you know, eat more food. So um, this next section is just about the class of medication or the group of medications. So they looked specifically at the different groups of medications and how it's affected by, um, or how it affects weight gain. So they found with integrase inhibitors um, that there is about a 7.1 pound increasing in weight. And they actually saw that this class of medications caused the greatest weight gain. Um, there was also a weight gain with the NNRTIs and protease inhibitors, um, but it was less so than the integrase inhibitors. So the NNRTIs, the increase was about 4.3 pounds over 96 weeks, and protease inhibitors was about 3.8 pounds. Um, but something to know is you're probably thinking, oh, that's not too much, like it's four, four to seven pounds. Or so, for someone who's maybe smaller, like that might be a significant increase. And you could even increase beyond that. So we already talked about how some people had a greater than 10% um, increase in weight. Um, so it could potentially go more than that, but on average, that's what they found for people who are starting treatment. And then they broke down the integrase inhibitors um, by which medication within that type of medication caused the most weight gain. So they found that Bictegravir, there was an increase of about 9.3 pounds. So as you can see, that's a little bit higher than the average. And um, then Dolutegravir was 8.9 and Elvitegravir was about six pounds. Then among the NNRTIs, which is Ropivirin and Efavirins, they found that Ropivirin caused more weight gain than Efavirin. So Ropivirin are 6.6 .6 pounds and Efavirins at 3.7 pounds. 
And then our NRTIs, um, so tenofovir, the, both types of tenofovir, um, abacavir and zidovudine, they found that the tenofovir alafenamide had more weight gain than the um, tenofovir disoproxyl fumarate. Um, so the tenofovir alafenamide, there was an increase in 9.4 pounds, which was significantly more than the tenofovir disoproxyl fumarate, which was 6.8 pounds. Um, and it was similar, and that was similar to abacavir, and the least amount of weight gain was with zidovudine with less than a pound. So, and I'm going to turn it over to Mandy, and she's going to talk about whether switching medications is an appropriate option after you potentially gain weight. Before um, Dr. Boyd can speak, thank you. I just wanted to take a pause and see if Benita wanted to chime in. Did you have any questions, Benita? Yes, I do. Thank you so much, Dr. Montgomery. I um, wanted to ask you, um, I've worked in the field for some time and um, being HIV positive for over 30 years and have experienced the weight gain um, since the 90s. Um, what are you sharing with your patients um, in terms of trying to make some difference in their weight gain? I know some people are going back to drug holidays that mm -hmm was an epic fail back in the day and going back to their older regimens that have a lot of the uh, side effects. Um, what are you recommending your patients? That's a good question. I'm not, I'm not gonna steal Mandy's thunder. She's actually gonna talk specifically about that coming up. <laughs> um, so I'll have her, I'll save it for her so she can tell you some good strategies. <laughs> okay, great, and so, and one more question. Yeah. So I understand that um, I know, you know, they don't specifically know what's causing it. So they're doing tons of research. Right. Um, is it targeted? Like, are they, do we know who they're using for the research? We know they leave Black women out a lot. Um, and also, is there anything here in the local North Carolina area where they're doing research? Oh, that's a really great question. Um, I know, so what I could, from what I could find that was come out so far, they're almost, they're looking back at trials. Um, so kind of looking at it kind of retrospectively. Um, I'm not positive if there's a current trial going on. It's a really good question. I'm not sure, LaShonda, if you know that. Um, but what, I, what we could do is look and see if there's anything available and kind of send it out to everyone. Um, I'm just not aware of any. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. McGarrett. What we'll do is um, if we know of any trials, when we post this video on our YouTube, we will share information that you can access information um, about trials. So that was an excellent question and we'll make sure that everyone can get those responses. And now we're gonna turn it over to Dr. Boykin. And if we run over about five or 10 minutes, if you have to excuse yourself, any of our attendees, thank you for being here. But if you are able to stay on, please do. Dr. Boykin? Yes, thank you. Um, and I'll try to be fairly quick um, about the rest of my slides. Um, to answer your question, um, there is some data to suggest that switching people from regimens could be beneficial, but ultimately um, there are additional studies that are needed. Um, it's pretty unclear as to what the weight gain is caused by, as Janelle alluded to earlier. It could just be um, untreated disease versus treated disease, um, and then just feeling healthier and um, that sort of thing. However, another hypothesis is that with some of the older agents, um, they may have side effects or other um, toxicities is kind of how they phrase it in the research that I did, such as stomach upset, nausea, vomiting, um, diarrhea, that sort of thing that would seem to normally combat people from using those agents. Um, but because the older agents are less weight positive, um, tends to be um, the theory behind that. So that's the proposal is that some of the older agents have side effects um, that may cause weight suppression or weight loss. Um, so looking at um, some of the studies that I looked at primarily with weight change. Um, so weight gain again is common upon starting therapy. Um, there are certain patient populations, women, African-American heritage, those that are further prolonged in their disease um, may be more susceptible to weight gain. Um, so the study that I looked at primarily was the difference between the tenofovir products. So going from TDF to TAF while being on other antiretroviral therapy. 
So if you look at the graphs above, um, essentially the five years leading up to when the switch was done in these patients, there was some weight gain, but it was very minimal um, in comparison to once they switched from TDF to TAF, as you'll see in the chart below the graphs, um, at months zero to nine, there was a significant weight gain than what they had experienced prior to. Um, and then again, the graphs above, you'll see at that nine month period, that's when um, the weight gain tends to kind of plateau. Some patients, and you'll see in later slides, either had um, the weight gain slowed down or potentially reversed with some of the agents that they were on. Um, but in general, from the study, they basically hypothesized that the TAF product um, can can be more causative towards weight gain versus TDF, which again is um, what Janelle had previously shown in a few slides before. Oh, you can go to the next one. Um, so this next slide takes a look at switching from TDF to TAF while patients are maintained on an integrase inhibitor. Again, looking at um, the, the five years prior to the switch up until when the switch was made, minimal weight gain, if not weight loss. Um, so you'll see that the Elvitigravir group, the Cobisostat, um, and the Dolutegravir group, um, they all had weight gain um, versus the Raltagravir group at the end. Um, and then at zero to nine months, again, this is when the weight had um, plateaued at that nine month period. Um, again, when switching from TDF to TAF. So despite which integrase inhibitor the patient was on, um, the switch from one of the Tenofovir products to the next um, did, was associated with weight gain, and then at that nine-month period, continues to kind of plateau slow or somewhat regress. And then lastly, um, they looked at switching um, the integrase inhibitor. Again, the same thing that we've shown in the previous studies is that there is slight weight gain, um, and then at that zero to nine-month period, when we see that switch, um, there's a weight there's weight gain and at nine months. Um, and if you look in that last group, there was some weight loss, um, could have been due to potential side effects from the medication. Um, but in the two groups below the Dolutagravir group um, and the other, um, it, there, it, the weight loss regressed. So switching gears a little bit, um, just looking at weight change and body mass index, um, we see here that um, the weight changes at the top graph, we're looking at an immediate switch between um, agents, and then the bottom graph is a delayed switch between agents. Um, so when the weight, uh, weight and BMI changes were analyzed for patients immediately switching to um, deriverine, lamuvidine, and um, tenofovir at week zero, or when it was delayed at week 24, they didn't really see any difference. Um, all of the patients maintained in their same weight or weight class category as far as the BMI goes. Um, but again, with this regimen, we have the TDF formulation as opposed to TAF, which again alluded to TAF me being more weight positive or potentially leading to weight gain um, when comparing those two products against each other. So in conclusion, I've kind of alluded to this several different times when switching from TDF to TAF, there was an association with uh, rapid weight gain specifically after the first nine months of therapy. But again, uh, starting any sort of re antiretroviral therapy can shock the body and cause potential weight gain because of untreated to treated disease. Um, we saw that TAF may be favorable as far as weight gain goes. Um, and then TDF may be associated with more side effects or toxicities that resulted in weight suppression. So in general, though, from these studies, they didn't conclude that there was any um, change in therapy as far as from a provider's perspective, as far as um, what recommendations to make to avoid integrase inhibitors or to avoid TAF out of concern for potential weight gain. Um, but again, some patients may elect to try older agents because of that weight suppression, um, but is the side effect, potential side effects worth, um, you have to weigh the benefit versus the risk, I would say. So is the weight gain reversible? Again, unfortunately, I don't have definitive answers, um, but 
further studies are needed. There are def definitely different things to take into consideration. Um, so looking at the mechanism behind what is causing the weight gain with the antiretroviral therapy, but also looking at the association, if there is an increased risk for disease, is the patient female? What is the age of the patient? What is the race? How long have, I, how long have they been on therapy? Um, what are their blood sugars or cholesterol looking like? Taking into consideration those factors. And then also, is there a relationship between um, antiretroviral therapy and weight gain? And then what happens if we stop these drugs or if we take drugs? holidays. So the, the jury is still out on those things. I know that's probably not the answer everyone's looking for, but um, if we can get some more information on this, I think it will help to decide if there's a more definitive approach. But um, at this time, it wasn't very clear, especially given all of the hypotheses that are behind um, what the potential weight gain is actually caused by. So how to manage weight, this is kind of just riding home what you typically know with diet and exercise, um, making sure that you're choosing nutritious foods and establishing better eating habits and better um, everyday habits. Um, some patients may elect to do a food diary in which you write down your foods and so you can see causative agents of what's a weight gain day versus a weight loss day or is there a specific food or activity that you've done that day that may um, have led to weight gain. Also implementing and maintaining an exercise regimen. So again, 150 minutes of moderate intensity aerobic activity where you're getting your heart rate up, where you're sweating, um, and at least two of those days having being um, strength activities to help build muscle, um, which will help also utilize your body stores, fat stores for fuel. Um, Self-monitoring your weight, and if weight isn't your thing and you don't want to weigh yourself on the scale, is there any other way that you can monitor your body for changes, whether that's inches that you've lost, whether it's the weight or the way that your clothes are fitting, um, maybe you're just feeling better in general, and then always talking to your practitioner to address any concerns that you may have. So setting achievable goals that are realistic, um, that are timely, um, so maybe it's you don't do anything and you want to work out two to three days a week for 20 minutes, setting that goal and going over that with your provider, or is it you need help with making better food options and you need a referral to a nutritionist. So always getting your provider involved and helping you set and achieve those goals, um, but ultimately not, not going untreated or stopping therapy on your own is the main recommendation here, um, working on lifestyle changes um, to kind of help combat some of those things until further research can be done to kind of establish and hone in on what exactly the cause of the weight gain is. So in summary, um, individuals with HIV may gain weight during antiretroviral initiation or at the time of switching regimen. Um, risk factors and patient demographics, again, women, African American descent can play a role in antiretroviral associated weight gain. The weight gain, um, weight changes may be class dependent. Um, so there's more gain in integrase inhibitors and TAF. There may be more suppression in other agents um, due to potential side effects. Lifestyle modification and care coordination with your healthcare provider can help limit the long-term consequences such as diabetes, such as stroke, um, elevated cholesterol, hypertension. Um, but in general, there's, no, there's not enough evidence to influence decision on what medications are chosen up front um, and kind of working with your provider to see what works best for you and your disease and then um, honing in on ways to do the weight loss strategies afterwards. So that's all that we had for you all today. Again, apologize for going over um, slightly, but hopefully, um, you know. No, thank you. Thank you both. I, I, first, I just want to make sure that our attendees know that Dr. Montgomery and Dr. Boykin are not affiliated um, with any type of research in regards to sharing this information or any uh, pharmaceutical agency. Our goal was to share the information um, with our community so that you can make the best and informed decision along with your health provider. And we thank you, Dr. Montgomery and Dr. Boykin, for your time, for um, being here for our community. We did have um, three questions, but I think they've all been answered. And one was how can we take um, HIV medication consistently and include healthy diet to decrease the weight gain. 
The second one was how can women of color who are positive be part of any clinical trials? And I know that we are going to share that information with you all later. You can get this information from our YouTube channel. And then lastly, do you recommend people living with HIV consult with a dietitian to create healthy eating habits? And I do believe that you answered um, those questions. I don't know if you wanna to touch upon them or... Yeah, I think for the last question, I would definitely consult a nutritionist. Um, obviously I'm, or Janelle and I are the drug experts. So we know a little bit more about the medications. And so I try to often refer my patients to patient or to people who are the experts in their field. Um, so you can ask us generalizable things about diet and exercise, but ultimately the nutritionist is going to be able to tell you what foods may work best for your body or how to monitor what things you should and should not be eating. Um, because what may work for me may not work for the next person. So I definitely would defer to them um, just so they can at least give you some sort of ideas of what you can and cannot do. And then you can kind of tweak it to cater to your lifestyle and your own. Another thing to look into is your insurance and see if they cover nutritionists. I know a lot of insurance plans are expanding like what they cover um, to have you know healthy employees, healthy people. So I would look into see if there, or if there might be an option to see a nutritionist or dietitian through your insurance as well. Awesome. Bonita, did you um, want to chime in from the perspective? I have like two more questions. Yes, yes. Okay, all right. So um, with injectables coming out and hearing that it's going to be more of the same and they're going to be like the weight gaining um, type regimens, do you suspect that people are not going to want to participate and use those since we're seeing a lot of weight gain starting or happening? That's a good question. I mean, I definitely think that's something to consider, um, especially if you've been on a similar medication and just looking at how you, your weight has responded to other medications. Um, I'd have to look and see like how often that medication would be given. But for example, like it might be worth maybe trying it or maybe, you know, seeing just how it works for you. Um, but we can certainly, maybe there's some information out there already on like what the impact on weight is. Um, so we can get more information so you're informed before you would make that switch. Um, that's a great question. Yeah, I think you have to look at the head to head as far as like, what, what are the benefits of the injectable therapy? Is it that you're not taking your medicine or you're not having to take something every day orally? Um, is that going to improve your adherence or is it going to worsen adherence because you're, it's not something that you do to the day to day to day. Um, so for you taking a once weekly or once daily injection may be beneficial, but if it's once weekly, am I going to remember once weekly? You never know. So I think it's very patient specific um, as far as the adherence piece too, because if you're not taking your medications, then it's not going to work at all anyways, regardless of if you have the weight gain or not. Thank you so much. I know it, um, I asked that question because uh, with Big Tarvey coming out and me being a, a long-term survivor, I sat back and waited to see what the response was with, and I I heard a lot of people talking about the weight gain. So that's one of the reasons that I had not made the switch um, because I've got, listen, my knees can't take no more on my back. So. <laughs> well, you know what, that, that is the real. Yes, listen, and the little six and nine pounds was sounding good, but when you're doing 50 to 100 pounds mm -hmm. of weight gain, you know, that's quite a bit. My last and final question is, um, HMAP or ADAP, do you suspect that they may add, I know a lot of insurances think, um, look at um, liposuction and the, uh, what's the other one? That, that Weight loss surgery? Yeah. Um, look at those as cosmetic surgeries. Do you suspect that they may try to add that to uh, <laughs> am I am I asking too much? I, I was, I, I, I'm not familiar with um, our federal dollars being spent on um, yes cosmetic. I That's think cool. that uh, once we can get some more information with lifestyle modifications and um, interdisciplinary ways to try to manage um, healthier lives, um, I'm pretty sure they're probably going to tap into that first. Yeah, yeah I would I would agree with that. Um, I think especially like in the primary care world, currently you have to show that you've 
done lifestyle modification for six months mm -hmm. before bariatric surgery or weight loss surgery can be considered. Um, so I don't think it's necessarily out of the realm. Will all insurances cover it? Probably not. But um, I think it would be a discussion that you would have with your provider as far as like making sure that things are adequately documented and making sure that you're actually giving a good faith effort to lose the weight. Because I know for some individuals, it is very hard to lose it, whether you're eating right, you're working out all the time, like the medication ultimately hinders that for some people. So if, if we're able to show, you know, they've done lifestyle modification for six months, eight months, 12 months, something like that, I think it would, it could be something in the future um, that gets considered because it's already something that I see in my clinic with some of my patients with diabetes all the time as they show the weight loss effort, and then they're able to go to bariatrics. So. Yes, thank you. And with people that are older, the older you get, it's harder to, to, to lose, lose the weight. That Correct. Might a little slow. Thank you so much, lady. This yes, ma'am. This, yeah. this has been a great um, help to the community of people that live with HIV, in particularly myself. And I'm looking forward to part two. <laughs> yes. So with that being said, Benita, um, we want to thank you, Dr. Montgomery and Dr. Boykin, for being here this afternoon. And we're looking forward to seeing you a month from now. And we would like to share with our guests what next month's topic will be. And that will be on August 26th. Again, it will be around the same time. We may increase the time frame to 45 minutes to an hour next time. Uh, Lashana, can I ask you a question before we let sure. everyone go today? Mm -hmm. um, if is there a way, if anyone has any like burning questions that they would like to know for the next topic, if they could submit those somehow and get those to us, so that we make sure that we address them and can be, you know, cognizant of everyone's time, that would be maybe something that we can do for the next talk. Oh, thank you. Yeah. 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 Um, awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you, ladies. All right. So, Destiny, you can take us out. Thank you all for being here. Thank you for your questions. So I have shared the link for the Eventbrite for next month's um, event in the chat box. If you did not receive it, I can try to email it to all of the attendees um, through our Eventbrite links, and then I will show the so time video. <laughs> Welcome to Soul Time. My name is Benita Spradley, one of the moderators and content contributors here, and we're excited to have you aboard. Hello, Queens, and welcome to Soul Time. I'm Tamisha Isaac, also one of your moderators and content contributors. I'm honored to have you join us. Soul Time is a platform for Black women to connect across the U.S. to provide tools for self-care and encourage consistent adherence. So Time is a platform for us, created by us, to collaborate and center issues that affects Black women, the struggle causes by a diagnosis or chronic illness. We have groups with specific topics to cater to the mission of So Time, but uplift, empower, and strengthen you as we power through on this journey. Surrounding yourself with women that look like you in a safe space where you are free to be yourself while learning from each other and sharing resources that can enhance your way of life on the course of this journey. We are here for each one of you. We welcome you and we look forward to networking, supporting one another and learning new things as we come together on this So Time website. Well, thank you. And um, if our panelists can just hold on for a moment and we say good night to all of our attendees. Thank you for being here.